Hi, welcome to storing credit cards and other sensitive information, although actually this is a little bit more concentrating on the storing credit cards aspect of it, but this, but eventually, but this is applicable to uh, storing anything you kind of want to try to hide from people in your internal company, and I only say that because most uh, information breaches are usually inside jobs. <clears throat> I don't know if who here actually has to, does anyone here find themselves having to store credit cards on site? Okay, like maybe two or three people. Uh, well, let me introduce myself a little bit first. My name is Solomon Chang. I'm a, I've been a MySQL DBA for a very, very long time. Um, I've been actually part of Scale. I've been part of Scale since Scale, since Scale One, when it was just called Scale, and they met in the basement of USC. Very few people seem to actually remember those days, but. Um, <coughs> I'm actually no longer with Visa, but when I submitted this talk, I was, and uh, things have kind of changed. It's funny, my, <coughs> my entire department got up, went over to Visa, so it's like I've got the same coworkers that I did back when I was at Visa. Um, basically, uh, I've got a pretty easy name to remember, uh, which back in high school, since Saul was short for Solomon. Um, and, well, Chang is Chang. Kids in high school used to say, it's the Saul Chang. <laughs> well, anyways, um, <laughs> yeah, I think I just dated myself there. I actually wanted to do something funny, but I, but I realized there wasn't enough time. I kind of wanted to get this little white, pina this white cylindrical piñata made for this talk and I would hang it up here right before the talk and break it open with a stick and all these credit cards would tumble out of it because all you flowchart people know that databases are these white cylindrical objects. <coughs> uh, eventually I realized though there was I wouldn't really be able to uh, get, get a pinata in time. All right, anyways, so before you actually store credit cards on site, you kind of have to, you first have to understand PCI compliance. As uh, as the as the internet started growing, basically a lot of uh, a lot of PCI a lot of the P a lot of PCI got really afraid that well there's going to be a lot more electronic payment fraud. And by the way, PCI stands for Payment Card Industry. So they so the various PCI companies like Mastercard, Visa, and so forth got together and said we need to actually make a set of rules for people who to follow if they're going to actually accept credit card payments. Not just the people who actually store credit cards, but we're talking about people who just simply process credit cards. If um, if you are going to actually process credit cards on site, you're going to have they're going to stick you in one of four levels. I mean, the small the the least of which is level four. Basically, if you're doing less than twenty thousand credit card transactions a year, uh, level three is twenty thousand to one million credit card transactions a year. Level two is one million to six million. And level one is six. It is over six million credit card transactions. If you're level two through level four, you're prob you're probably fine in that you can just simply fill out a you can just fill out a self assessment every year, and say, okay, this is exact. This is how good our security is. I probably am going to be admitting too much. I'm not going to say any names, but I have actually worked with some companies in the last 10 years that we have actually stored credit cards and not even reported or done any of the self, self security assessment. If you are level one though, you are, um, that's, where you're, that's where you get into a nice little bit of trouble. You get to get audited by an ASV or, oh. Huh? Is over six million. Basically, the basically the lower your level get, the the lower your level get, the m I mean, the more trans credit card transa tra transactions you do, the lower your level actually gets. Um, hmm? No, over six million. Period. I could say that cy CyberSource itself is uh, over is over six million. Um, 
visa itself obviously is over six million in fact we're talking about well into the hundreds of millions of transactions a year if not billions pay pal itself is is easily over six million since I've never actually worked for pay pal I can't really get give any figures now the one of the now despite the fact that these are different levels if you ever have a credit card breach you are promoted to level one now this means that you're going to have to you're going to have to get a yearly audit and getting audited from it from from an authorized security vendor is not any fun your business basically gets shut down during the time that they're auditing you not they don't say we you have to shut down your business it's just that the things that they're going to want to crawl over are going to end up shutting down your business and I mean basically you can think of it as you're progressing down through the level your you're lowering your level by the time you hit level one they take away your epic armor your legendary mount all your magic weapons <coughs> If you ever um, if you ever get a security breach, you are automatically demoted to level one. You're told you have to go pick out. You have here is a list of ASVs that uh, that that we can send to you. They will audit your company. You get to foot the bill for paying for for their audit. Different ASVs basically charge a di charge different amounts of money. So and cheaper is not necessarily better. Basically, a really really budget ASV has absolutely no incentive to try to not disrupt your business. Authorized security vendor? Now of course, and usually when an ASV shows up on site, they're going to, I mean, they all have their own checklist of what they're going to check. But at a very, at a very bare minimum, they're just they're going to make sure that you've got no no default or non-existent passwords on any equipment or services make sure that you don't have uh, you can't get in via SSH without root, root access to SSH without a password or MySQL without a password you make sure your all your routers actually don't have their default passwords to them um, they're going to make sure passwords to sensitive resources are not easily retrievable by normal users um, this usually, I mean, I've actually been to a lot of places where a normal user can just check out some F code out of SVN and there's like root password to some critical service actually print right there hard in hard in hard coded. Here's a, an interesting one. They will check that no credit cards are transferred over plain text. Remember when I said that all ASVs are the same? Some ASVs, I've actually, okay, I've I've actually sat, watched an I've actually watched an audit four times in my life. One of those ASVs actually insists. I mean, a lenient ASV will say, "We don't actually want a." I mean, plain text just means at your outside network. Your machines can communicate to each other. Uh, I mean, in plain text, some really really strict ASVs or ones who don't know what they're doing will say, "Nope, it can't even be plain. T it can't even be plain text from say." if you're replicating from master to slave, you're going to have to encrypt that traffic too. Some of them will actually be so strict as to just say, we're going to, act, we're, we're going to start sniffing network traffic between, we're going to start sniffing network traffic in your cage. And if we just happen to come across a 16 digit number that fulfills the mod 10 algorithm, we're going to start, we're going to look a little closer. I'll get into what the mod 10 algorithm is in a moment. Um, you, they are going to ask to look at your database. You are not allowed to store chip data, stripe data, CVVs, or pins on your system. I mean, you can request these things when you're checking out, but most of the time, people who actually uh, want to protect themselves by e-commerce will simply will simply contract another outside agency like Authorize.net or CyberSource or PayPal to say, well, this you we would like you. I mean, I want you to be our payment gateway. This way, that outside service, that payment gateway, does not ha you don't actually handle the credit card of the person that you're accepting payment from. They sim that payment gateway simply gives you an API that you plug into your web app, and you just simply say, this is how much that you're, you want <coughs> to charge, this is your user, and you send a few codes through the API, and that API comes back and says whether or not the credit card was approved or bounced or, or whatever. Yeah? 
true that CDDs can be stored up until the point when you do the transaction and they have to be discarded? Well, yeah. Temporarily you, storage, you can temporarily store them. Yeah. I mean, otherwise, you, otherwise, if you actually have a page, if you have a multi-page form, then you... Well, we run into the situation where, like, I'm sorry, .net doesn't have a response for instance. You have mm -hmm. to hold on to that until we get a valid response. Right. Then we dispose of it. Right. But for the most part, they're going to want access I mean, some ASVs will want access to your your PC to your PCI database, and they want to make sure that you're not actually storing it long term in there. Okay. Um, so Sarbanes Oxley, or basically Sox, which is another whole set of different compliance, is now stating that they want your credit card database to be stored on a completely different system than your home than than where you than wherever your database cluster normally resides. Uh, so, <coughs> usually most of them, especially if you happen to hit level one, are going to want a means of logging who or what accesses your credit card information. Of course, this makes it very easy to determine this make when when a credit card breach occurred, if a credit card breach occurred. I I'm not going to say any names, but I will say it's a company that was acquired by a co another company that I worked for within the last six years that actually that actually uh, had a logging system. One of their passwords was available, but one of their users was suddenly shown grabbing 500,000 credit card numbers in the course of 30 minutes. And he wasn't, apparently he wasn't aware of the logging that was uh, in place. And well, the problem was we didn't really know it was that person. We only knew it was one of 17 people. So the company kind of just says, we're going to put we're going to put 17 of you on administ paid administrative leave. Don't consider this like a vacation, because once we are done with our once we're done with our investigation, 16 of you are coming back to work. The 17th person is going to go to jail. Um, it's still in progress. All important credit card information is stored in its own database. I think I already mentioned this. This is this it, that actually is was more of a that was actually more of a requirement of Sarbanes Oxley these days than than PCI. But PCI kind of overlapped, and Sarbanes Oxley grabbed that clause and said, "Hey, that sounds like a pretty good clause. Uh, we're going to consider that as part of our compliance as well." Yeah. As far as those uh, default or non-existent passwords, basically uh, most ASVs at the very bare minimum are going to check your routers, check your basic network services, I mean to make sure that there's no non-existent passwords there, databases, and, um, and to see who's worth letting everybody work as a privileged user. I can't, there are a fair number of data uh, companies that I've seen that allow a their central master database, the MySQL root user simply doesn't have a sim simply doesn't have a password. They, I mean, the you basically need key. You need some kind of uh, SSH key to get into into the database itself. But once you're in, you basically it's soft on the inside. You can get access to you can get access to whatever you want in, in the MySQL <coughs> database. That is not allowable from that's not allowable from the point of PCI compliance. They want everything to be hardened. Yeah. No, that I mean keys are keys are just as good, if not better. But I've seen people who say I'm just going to protect the S root SSH login to a database. And, but once you're in your root, you suddenly have you suddenly have access to um, to everything. Whereas a more appropriate whereas a more appropriate way of uh, of allow allowing people into your database is you have an SSH key to a non-privileged user of that database server, and that non-privileged user still needs some kind needs a password to get into that MySQL database. It's amazing how people actually grab passwords to uh, to a database. I mean, in this case, even a PCI. I mean, usually a PCI database. 
Some people think just because I've got my database, PCI database off to one side and it's got a different password, has a different way of accessing, means that it's actually protected. Um, there are plenty of there's there are a few cases where a few malicious users in the company, and the reason why I say that is more the majority of credit card breaches in companies are actually inside jobs. They are not they're not just someone coming in from the outside and, and stealing it and stealing cards. You tend to hear more in the news about people actually <laughs> coming in stealing cards, but um, well, I'll just say I'll just say from the standpoint as a visa as a visa employee that I've that most of the cases of most of the breaches I see in other companies are usually because somebody inside uh, somebody inside got really pissed off at the company and decided to to try to uh, take revenge. Usually, these people who are angry can can pull up the their PCI passwords from or the PCI database passwords from places from places as easily as just going to a web server, pulling up the process list, and for somebody may have written a <coughs> script in which he had to pass in the password as one of the arguments. They'll just see it right there, in, right there in plain text on the process list. So, but there are ways that you can actually guard against that. I, I haven't actually written, figured out how to prevent it from happening on the command line, but I know it's possible because my SQL does it. Anybody here ever pass in an, uh, password on the command line to MySQL and then pull up the process list. One of the really nice things that MySQL does is if on the command line you say MySQL dash P and then password and then you look at it in the process list, it shows up in the process list as MySQL dash P X X X X X. So MySQL binary actually has some way of blanking of of blanking out that password argument, but a lot of people tend to write their own scripts where you pass in an argument and, yeah? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought that was a hand. Um, so there, there, so there, I know that there's got to be a way to actually modify your script that messes around with what it tells the pro process list it is. Yeah? Um, I mean, another place where passwords tend to get leaked is usually cron tabs. People end up pe putting in, also put a, need to pass in passwords to some to a MySQL utility, and sometimes they stick it directly in their cron tabs. The cron tabs aren't aren't very well guarded, and an angry employee opens it up, sees it. Yeah. No, that counts, as long as the password isn't actually in a cron tab where someone can protect it. So, I mean, you can actually protect yourself by just having that cron tab sit on a dedicated cron I mean, machine that does nothing but runs crons that are, as long as it is not viewable by, by a low-level user in your, right, right. Basically, an ASV is going to assume that everybody in your company is out to screw you. That is specifically that is something that would be up to the ASV. Certain ASVs have certain requirements as to what they want, and unfortunately, if you actually get deal with enough ASVs over time, they you will find two ASVs that have two completely di conflicting requirements. But like, well, I mean, I wouldn't say completely conflicting. Like the whole plain text require transmission over plain text requirement tends to differ from ASV to ASV. Some of them will say within your network is okay. Others will say no. If it's within your network, even that is considered, uh, even that is considered considered not PCI compliant. Command history. It's amazing how many uh, te how many angry users sometimes can just simply go to an unprotected terminal and hit your up arrow key a few times until they see a until they actually see a command that you've entered in the pa your password to um, from the command line. Sometimes um, an angry user will just simply find a way to get your bash history, grab that, and then pick it at a pick it at a later point. 
Now, even though I say angry user, I should actually qualify that by saying an, uh, an authorized security <laughs> vendor, au well, an auditor, because an auditor will also say, I want, let me, let me take a look at your dot .bash history. Oh, look, you've actually entered in the, the root password for your PCI database off on, off on there. That's a ding against you. Uh, likewise, they'll probably look for, I mean, they have, it, they'll look for it hard-coded into source. Uh, this is probably just as easy as saying I'm, I mean, as quick as saying I'm going to just take an SVN and grab an SVN image of your source code and easily just grep for your password if it's there. Yeah? So I'm paranoid enough to uh, completely wipe out my bash history from time to time, but I mean, one of the other ways which I've, al one of the ways which uh, is considered PCI compliant is to just have a password file that's not readable by anyone except a specific user. And that password file is basically, well, and usually it's preceded by a dot to hide it, so not, er and so it's not always known where it is. I mean, so it's not always visible. It's not always visible. Someone who's just casually looking around won't see something that says dot password. Yeah. No, not a problem. But, you know, also, the, your password should not be convenient to have to type anyway. So they should be in a file that says you can't possibly right. remember them in the first place. And if you can remember your password, that's probably yeah. the issue. Yeah. By the way, I totally welcome interruptions because I only put together 22 slides, and I'd like to try to stretch this out to the <laughs> hour. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's allowable depending on how strong the encryption is. I mean, PCI compliance still calls for a key. I still calls for a specific key length of. Um, still calls for a certain. I mean, a certain level of security, which is usually going to be a key length of a certain amount. Most peop most ASVs are will just recommend to you generate a GP generate a GPG key of so of so of a certain length. And we'll and we'll let you pass on this one. <coughs> that I mean, for the m for the most part, if you actually go to Visa's site, they've got a list of all these uh, authorized security vendors that they, well, auditors that um, that you could choose to go through if you've been summoned for a for a PCI compliance audit, and you can be you, <coughs> or if you are really really unfortunate, like I think I once did on Facebook, I accidentally used the keywords PCI compliance in my. Um, in my Facebook profile postings, and even today, like six months later, I'm still getting these sponsored ads on the side saying, "Are you looking for a PCI compliance auditor? <coughs> have you been? Have you been? Has your business been dinged?" I'm thinking, "No, no, no." So, um, so screw you, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most people, though, don't really make these mistakes. I mean, they've most of these mistakes. Most of these are kind of already a part of any secure of any security manual. Uh, like I said, some PCI auditors are c w are just so simple as to say, "I'm going to I'm just going to sniff your network traffic for any numbers that match the mon mod 10 algorithm." This is also known as the LUN algorithm. You can also look this up, but I'll cover this in a moment. 
um, a lenient, I mean, a, le a lenient auditor will just simply say, I only worry about, I only worry about the traffic outside of your, your internal network. A, um, a strict auditor, or you didn't hear this here, even though this is being recorded, an auditor who wants to squeeze more money out of you is going to say, uh, yeah, I'm going to include the traffic that's actually inside your network. Mod 10 algorithm is basically a verification algorithm that sort of like a really, really simple checksum to determine whether or not your credit card, I mean, whether or not a number is a valid credit card. So if I were to take this if I were to take this really, really sensitive credit card number, nobody write this down because this is my credit card number, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Well, I'm not going to tell you what the last digit is, so that should actually be a. <laughs> oh, wait. Damn, I think I have it down there. So, what they actually do with the mod 10 algorithm is this last, I left this last digit out intentionally for now. This is sort of, this is your checksum digit. There, <clears throat> in order to actually see what this last digit should be, you're going from this, from this digit, from the second to last place, to every single, to every other number, you're, they're going to double, you're going to double that value. So that, um, I mean, well, basically you're going to double this value. The, these other digits are pretty much going to be the same. And of these values that are doubled, of everything that you see across this line, you are going to add up all those single digits together. So, well, two is by itself, so that's two. Two is by itself, so that's two. Six, four. One plus zero is one, so that comes out to one. Six is okay. One plus four in 14 is five. One plus eight is nine. And when you finally add up all of these, when you finally add up all these numbers, well, in this particular example, we come up with 58. Uh, the final digit must be such that when added to the sum, the modulus will be zero, and so, and any other modulus is considered an invalid checksum. This means that because this because this sum is 58, this number must be two. Um, anything else is not really a valid credit card number. Yeah. If huh? Yeah. Yeah, that is. And if you actually were to do this experiment with four about followed by 15 ones, that is PCI. I mean, that not PCI compliant. This it does. It is mod 10. It is mod 10 validated. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, this is a very very loose validation because this does not protect. I mean, it's easy to transpose certain. It's easy to transpose some digits in a credit card it, that. That will cause the che that will cause the checksum to still pass. Like, well, I mean, obviously, uh, I think the term I think the term was. Um, well, I mean, I forgot what it was, but this is not this is not perfect. It's possible to still make typing mistakes in this, and in the credit card still and the credit card still passes. Uh, another little quick aside here is. When I said some PCI vendors don't, I mean, are st don't like any plain text credit cards to be transmitted inside your network. If your PCI database <coughs> is still going to have a replication architecture to it, you're pro you're going to want to you're going to want to encrypt traffic from master to slaves. <coughs> MySQL actually makes this really easy. You can just generate an SSL cert from the command line. You may, <coughs> of course, this will give you this will give you a couple of files. P I mean, I mean, I'll make this available later on. But basically, you create a P you create a PEM, you plug in, uh, you basically copy those files to your mas to to your MySQL directory on your master. Add a couple of add a couple of lines. SSL under MySQL D just says, hey, I want to actually replicate via SSL encryption. And then on your slave, you basically you basically run a change master statement. And up until now, I'm sure most people thought all change all change master was good for was just changing positions in a bin log. Uh, basically, you say whatever. I mean, you just plug in the values of the cert, copy uh, one of one of these files gets copied to your slave. I'm going to have to double check that, and then start slave. Oops. Oh, I thought I heard. So. Okay. Um, 
And I mean, that's pretty much it. This was, uh, I kind of lifted this from Shiri's PC, from Shiri's SSL talk, which was actually like five minutes long from a few years ago. But you can find this just about anywhere online. I mean, you can, you can do this within three minutes flat. Depending on what level of encrypt, I mean, depending on how many, uh, depending on how many bits encryption you want, you can make this uh, just about as secure as you want. Uh, as I was saying earlier, you're not allowed to store strike data, chip data, CVVs, or pins. Now, frankly, I have no idea what's on that on that chip data. I don't know if anybody else does, but I do know that it is incriminating enough that at the last at the last DEF CON, no, second to last DEF CON conference I was at, there was actually a demonstration where a guy with a square, I mean, where a guy with an RFID reader is able to take a volunteer on stage, read whatever, I mean, act basically read whatever was on her credit card chip through her purse, and then using a square, using a square uh, writer, basically take a blank credit card and, repro and print out a credit card clone of what she had in her purse. <coughs> he then proceeded to charge $5 <coughs> to that credit card, which actually went through. And, but, he but he compensated her with 20 bucks. <laughs> so in essence, she, well, okay, she made $15 out of it, but the whole point of this talk was basically to show that whatever that, that chip data is, is thorough enough to recreate the strike data on the credit card itself and actually charge money to it. Uh, Stripe data, well, likewise, that contains most of everything that's on the credit card itself. Um, I haven't actually, I haven't actually pulled out a Stripe reader lately and taken a look to see what's on, what's on there. But I'm, but being that I've seen people who have been able to clone Stripe data and charge against that credit card, it's, it's enough to reconstitute the entire credit card. CVVs, you're not allowed to store those long term in the database. And PIN numbers, you're also not allowed to store those long-term in a database. And an auditor will typically say, I want access to wherever you t tend to store long-term credit card information, and I wa want to see if that information is actually in there. Now, of course, unfortunately, here's one of, here is a catch-22. <coughs> it's a point in favor of you if you've encrypted the entire table and you can't see, and you can't see any of this information, but it also gets in your way you have to actually spend time to decrypt the table for the auditor or basically break some of your own PCI compliance rules such as auditing access to the table in order to sh prove to him that you're not storing any of this. Basically, the thing that sucks about in a PCI audit is the proof of burden becomes on you to show that you're not actually storing any of this. Uh, well, a lot of people will say, but, but I, I still need to actually be able to access certain, or my, my minions, well, that is auditors who, the people that the auditors think are out to get you, still need to be able to access credit card data for, for the most basic of functions. How many here have actually uh, gotten a chargeback on a credit card from a, fr from a customer? Well, okay. So, huh? Huh? Or, or dispute. Yeah. But basically, usually what happens is that the customer does, I mean, files a, dis files a dispute, and <coughs> most of the time the credit card company is going, to side with the, is going to side with the consumer and initially will send you a little, mess, a little letter that says this, pers this person has filed a chargeback. And this chargeback, unfortunately, doesn't always include enough information to to know immediately off the bat who it was that filed that chargeback. They might give you a last name in four digits and an amount number and say, this person has charged back this amount. So if you haven't been keeping good records, you, uh, you have absolutely no idea who actually charged you back, especially if you've done over 200,000 transactions that month. So you are, what you are allowed to actually keep in unencrypted format our cardholder names, last four digits of the card, the expiration date, and the credit card transactions themselves. This is actually deemed sufficient to look to 
to look up whatever information you need for a for chargeback and to match it to your own records. If you actually have these unencrypted, then it's not really a point against you in PCI compliance. Hmm? Oh. Um, it's actually, huh? It's part of the, it's the last digit. Huh? It is part of the last four. But even, I'm sorry, when you said check digit for a moment there, I thought you meant CVV and I was about to say, no, it's just printed. Hmm? Right. It's also called the LUN algorithm. But if you Google for mod 10, it's like there's a hundred <coughs> links that all will show you how the, the mod 10 algorithm, I mean the LUN algorithm works. Yeah. There, well, the first primary way is they actually send you to a payment gateway that kept that information. Um, as far as what you're not allowed to hold, Well, basically, from what you're not allowed to hold, you don't always need the CVV in order to uh, con complete a transaction. It's just an, an additional layer of security. I don't know how Amazon does it, but somehow Amazon is able to get away with holding your 16-digit card number on file, and they're not allowed to hold your CVV. So when they do their one-click shopping bit, they somehow get away with charging without the CVV. They, hmm? I have not actually worked with enough dot-com startups that uh, that have shopped for this to actually compare the different rates that different payment gateways would actually give us. And then but I'll check out too, they'll, they'll store everything but the CVV and you have to put that in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've seen plenty of businesses that don't ask for a CVV. I think, I mean, I don't really even think the CVV is necessary. But uh, as far as one-click shopping portals, they, they'll just, all they really need to do is just keep your credit card on file, and they can charge the card without submitting your CVV. Who knows? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing that Amazon, in this case, probably got threatened with it and said, we are going to, we are going to knock you down to PCI compliance level one. And Amazon probably said, we're uh, Amazon, ha ha, we already do six million credit card transactions a year. Being knocked down to level one is not going to impose any further penalty. Yeah. Per year. Per year. But I wouldn't be surprised if Amazon pulls it off per month. But I'm saying level, the only qualification to be level one is you're doing more than six million transactions per year. Uh, let's see here. And then obviously you're allowed to keep your all the invoices for a specific person um, in plain text. Yeah.
Yeah. Uh, no, uh, it's that three-digit code on the back of, huh? I've never actually read what was on. The funny thing is, I've always been so paranoid about the places that I've had access to a Stripe reader at. Like, for example, I've had access to a Stripe reader at Visa, but I've been so paranoid as to, am I being audited when I'm using this, that I've never really dared to, whenever I've had the opportunity to read Stripe data, I've never really dared. I never knew who, true, right? huh? Usually there's, Mm-hmm. Yeah. Somewhere in the payment off in the payment gateway authorization process, there is somebody at some endpoint who actually does have that CVV in order to compare against what you end up. Before they were bought out, authorize.net and Cybersource actually would connect directly to Visa for that information. You give the CVV to to authorize.net, authorize.net then has their own way of contacting Visa and says, does this uh, match? And incidentally, I should probably mention, uh, in case anyone hasn't been watching the news lately, Visa seems to be in this buying spree of scooping up all these different payment gateways. Now, v Visa now owns authorize.net and Cybersource, so that those are actually integrated directly into their database. So when you actually uh, get an a Cybersource account, you're communicating directly with Visa's database backend. Now, as for auditing access, I mean, obviously, from time to time, if you're doing a one-click, if you're doing one-click shopping, you're still going to need to pull out that plain text credit card at some point in order to charge it or in order to pass it on to your payment gateway. Uh, as long as this is a a larger, a larger company is actually going to insist <coughs> that you audit whoever is accessing this card. The most common way of actually doing this is just write a little, just write a little stored procedure. Um, don't allow anyone, don't allow any of your MySQL users to directly select from that table. In fact, all access, all read access to that table should be through a stored procedure that logs who's the user that tried to, uh, that requested a number, what card he requested. When did he, when he did he request it? And if you have a list of reasons for why he requested it, then um, then list that reason. I will admit though that the logs that I've kept for some of my previous e-commerce companies gets really tedious because the user who's connecting is a patch. I mean, is just a web server, and the reason is because some customer bought something from us. There is no g oh yeah, and when you actually create this stored procedure that returns a single credit card company, I've noticed. I mean, in any e-commerce operation, there is absolutely no good reason why this stored procedure should allow multiple credit card companies to, I mean, multiple credit card numbers to be returned in a single in a single read. Of course, sometimes people will leave it out as low-hanging fruit to see if there's anyone malicious in the company, malicious enough or stupid enough to say, I want to all credit card numbers that begin with 4231. And, and <laughs> something comes back, and of course you log this, and HR, if you get the visit from HR the next day. Huh? Oh. <laughs> Right. Right. Because at some point you're going to have to decrypt that credit card in order to submit it to your payment gateway. Some payment gateways and cyber source actually, uh, yeah. Right. Right. I mean, cyber source actually offers this interesting service that says. You, we can uh, deal with you not even touching a credit card number. It, we, you can say, you are, you're a member, you've subscribed to us, here's an API, you send us a few parameters identifying your membership, identifying um, 
identifying a session ID, identifying the user who is, act, I mean, an amount number, and you just open up a frame or a or a, win, or a pop-up window with this information. That person basically then fills out that information. It processes his credit card through that, or and and it return and the cyber source API just returns this little uh, confirmation that says, okay, the card did go through. Sixteen dollars has been credited to your account. You can proceed with uh, you can proceed with whatever it was that this person was buying, or it return or you can get a return code that says, sorry, this credit card bounced. And your your application can say, well, based off of that code, I'm going to redirect my user to to this page that says, do you have another credit card? But the point, whole point of that is, throughout that process, that happened in a completely different session, which has nothing to do with your web page, other than maybe being embedded in an iframe inside of your web page, and you've never even touched the credit card. This actually releases you from PCI compliance obligations. I mean, obviously, there is still the whole. Uh, we would prefer that you uh, had a, had SSL, SSL encryption on that site, on that page that you're accepting a card on, even though it's an, even though the iframe itself might have an S, an HTTPS connection to that particular payment gateway. Um, we've pretty much told the masses throughout for the last four years that if you're going to do anything sensitive on a web page, you must see that HTTPS. Uh, if there is a good reason to allow multiple credit card numbers to be returned in a record set, it's probably because you're trying to entrap someone in your company. But you didn't hear that from me, even though, yes, you probably can get this video later and say, see, Solomon said that. Um, it's actually, when, you've ac when you're auditing access, uh, I'm sure a lot of people here use Nagios or Splunk or any number of other alerting systems. It's, there's a couple of good things to put onto the whatever log that you're auditing your credit card numbers through. I mean, whether your log consists of a straight text file or whether it's actually a table that records access to credit cards, you, you'll probably want to log things like who, well, obviously you'll want to log who made the request <coughs> so that if later on a phone, one of your phone support representatives, uh, you need to confront him and say, there's I mean, you're checking a credit card, er you're calling up a credit card every two minutes, what's going on here? <coughs> um, when basically, when, when it happened, and why is sort of an iffy thing. Why is, well, when I say iffy, more like a human can provide a reason each time, but it starts to get tiring when, you're, when you have an automated application that, uh, an automated e-commerce application that's doing the credit card processing for you uh, day in and day, in, day out, as well as which record was requested. But this is just com this this is pretty much just common sense. If you use Nagios or you use Zabbix or any number of <coughs> other alerting systems, um, a good number of alerts is basically to start checking to see whether this audit log is growing faster than expected. Um, usually what I do is I just simply have a database table of all my credit card accesses, not of the credit cards themselves, but the people and times and reasons why credit cards were accessed. And if it just so happens that this table is growing past a certain, past a certain expected rate, then to automatically, automatically send me a page, uh, to, also send me, to also send me an automatic page if there are any too many lookups by the same requester in a very short amount of time. There's what I mean. There, this tends to, this falls under two tiers. There's the user who's just simply sitting at his desk trying to steal credit cards as fast as he humanly can, and then the next level above that is someone who's sitting at his desk having written a script that's grabbing 500 credit card numbers a second, which obviously is a much higher priority alert than um, someone who's casually grabbing one every minute. Um, Another alert: if there are employee, if there are lookups happening at any unusual times, usually our call centers have, I mean, are staffed by people who have specific shifts. Certain people who, like someone who works the graveyard shift, who's suddenly, who's suddenly pulling up a credit card number at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. No, I'm sorry, that guy's supposed to be asleep. What the hell is he doing, doing it at a weird time? 
Usually it's the other way around. People that you know are supposed to work the regular day shift and suddenly they're querying your PCI database for credit card information at three in the morning. That, that's alert worthy. <coughs> Uh, also, sometimes checking to see whether the lookup function received bad parameters. Sometimes people like to mess around with. Sometimes people like to mess around with certain um, with, with certain web page query arguments, and this could result in bad parameters that get passed into your credit that get passed into your stored procedure. Uh, I'll admit, from time to time, I like to see if I can actually do bad things to Facebook by just simply changing the query string arguments that get passed in. And I'm pretty sure that lots of people who lots of people who like who like to test the security at your credit card company or could easily do the same thing from a web app. Also, a malicious user just simply says, "Hey, I've noticed that this iframe came up in my browser and it has uh, it has these weird arguments in the query string." number of tools like Firebug will let you just simply open up, will let you open up that iframe and change the parameters on the fly, reload and see what happens. A badly written, a badly written app will actually uh, allow them to do bad things. Well, I mean, that, that's only, a, that's just a given. But one of the more interesting security vulnerabilities that came out in the early, early days of Apache was that you could, you could put in your URL and then you could put in a pipe after that URL and then put in system commands after that. So what would happen is that Apache, well, running as a user Apache would just simply, um, would just simply treat whatever URL that was, well, however it would, how, whatever that URL would do normally on a command line, but treat that pipe as actually a command to be run on the command line. And so a lot of early, uh, a lot of early hacking through Apache would occur exactly by that methodology. You say, well, I want to actually, uh, I want to actually look at the Etsy password file. So basically, cat et so URL pipe cat et Etsy password. And if the person had sufficiently uh, l uh, sufficient resources, he could probably figure out what some of the hashes in were in there. Of course, I'm also speaking back to the days when um, pass ha those hash passwords were kept in Etsy password rather than Etsy shadow. <coughs> okay, like I said earlier, I just dated myself. Uh, architectures. Well, unfortunately, most of, uh, most of the previous bosses that I've done ar different architectures for would kind of told me that I can talk about architectures. They would rather that I not diagram them. So this page is kind of, so this page is kind of blank. Um, one of the most I mean, the most common architecture of PCI compliance is just simply you have your, data your, your database of credit card number, credit card information, and then your database of everything else. Your credit card information database is going to have completely diff is going to have completely diff different validations and uh, user accounts than your other database. That is like the absolute base level. Obviously, points in favor of is if you actually encrypt if you actually encrypt the tables on that credit card database some places have will just use a will just generate a key, I mean a public private key to actually use against that table um, I'm actually in favor of using of throwing on Lux I mean the Linux unified key system which is a key, which is hard which encrypts the entire hard drive this so that when you actually mount the drive, you actually have to put in a Lux password in order to decrypt it. This has actually been traditionally to guard against people you don't trust in your data center who have access to the front and they just tear out the hard drive and walk off with it. Um, if anyone, oh, uh, g another security measure I've implemented on top of this before was, is anyone here familiar with the black hole storage engine? I bet you thought it was a joke. Yeah, basically for those who, uh, basically as you know, MySQL has different storage engines that you can pick for tables, and one of them is the black hole storage engine. This is like dev null for a table. You, the table is perpetually empty. Anything that you insert into the table is just is gone. However, I mean, and most people would say, well, that ha ha, that sounds really funny, but there actually is a legitimate reason for the black hole storage engine. 
in your replication topology, not every single machine has to, I mean, a table does not have to run the same storage engine across different machines. You could have a slave that is what we call, what you would just call your PCI slave that has as its, or excuse me, um, you can have, or you can have as, you can have as your PCI slave something that's running in ODB as its credit card table storage engine, and on everything else on your architecture running black, running a black hole storage engine. So let's say on the master it's that table's a black hole. On a, on your secure slave, it's a an in ODB table. Credit card number gets inserted into the black hole table on the master, disappears instantly, but it replicates normally to the slave, which it inserts properly. So, um, the only thing you now have to watch for is that credit card number is now in plain text on, it, or depending on what you've used for encryption, that insert operation is still available in the bin log of the of the master. But you can also say you can also specify on all as another security step on all your slaves to say I don't want to replicate any information going to the credit card going to the credit card table. That prevents the relay log and the bin logs on all those subsequent slaves from not having any of that credit card information. It's just gone on those machines. You can trust your user you can trust your developer base to access those databases without actually compromising the credit card numbers on that on that secure on that PCI slave. Um, usually for encryption methods, um, I'm not I myself am not happy with just having one single key encrypt my entire credit card table. Whenever I actually have to insert a new credit card table into a uh, insert a new credit card number into a table, I actually will just generate a new random key from scratch for that particular credit card. And actually store those keys via a, v and store those and store those keys uh, via a just an I a credit card ID to the original hash. That entire table is actually kept somewhere else, so that when you actually have to decrypt a credit card number, you actually have to grab the key individually and grab the credit card number, and not and just like how I've talked about not making entire blocks of credit card numbers visible, I'm. I'll, I will restrict f making the entire table of keys visible. Oh, I didn't know if that was a hand. Um, but the most com but the most common architecture is just simply having your having your credit card database as a completely different server. One one really really paranoid client that I've actually had actually insisted that this that this key table was not only stored elsewhere, but if there was a certain compromise that would occur on the credit card server, that the key table would, I mean, that the key server would be totally inaccessible except physically. So without going into too much detail, um, I mean, this is one of my mo most convoluted setups, but I actually had changed the MySQL start and stop script to just completely delete all host mapping to that part to that key server if the MySQL service ever got started and stopped and would actually have to be restored manually, which meant someone would have to physically go down to the data center and actually go uh, go go, res go restore the host map. Unless you already knew what the host mapping was, in which only the senior DBA and the CEO of the company were were aware of. So <coughs> So that's basically, I mean, that's basically what the, but just simply having a different server running your, holding your credit cards and being encrypted is still considered uh, mostly PCI compliant. You can generally use most of these architectures for storing anything sensitive, uh, being that that was what the subtitle of this talk was, and sen other sensitive information. But the primary, but the primary focus of, uh, of this talk is that most of these breaches should really be approached from the idea of what if somebody within my own organization had it in for me and was trying to actually and was trying to take and wanted to take info from me. I mean, whether this person is one of your own sysadmins or one of your own DBAs, what ac what resources does this person actually have access to that if he suddenly turned rogue on you that he could act that he could pull up? And I'm not just I mean I'm not just talking about the fact that he's got your passwords, someone who is managing your data center, like I was saying earlier, could probably just pull out, can probably just pull out your hard drive on the, on the fly. 
I mean, is your hard drive decryptable if somebody actually does this? Um, I'm going to actually take another little aside from another DEF CON incident about six years ago where it was demonstrated that if you really, really wanted to thwart hard drive encryption, um, what you could do is while the computer was still plugged in, you could ease it out of the rack and then dump it in a 50 gallon drum of liquid nitrogen. The liquid nitrogen actually freezes the, I mean, freezes the dims, I mean, whatever state the dims were on, and when you, and as long as you kept it completely froze, as long as you kept it completely frozen, you could actually read those dims before they thawed out and use, and use whatever, um, use basically decrypt in an, an otherwise encrypted hard drive uh, before the hard drive, before the hard drive and the dims thawed out, because those dims had, I mean, already had the driver and keys already loaded in memory. But we're talking about a multi-million dollar, we're talking about a multi-million dollar extraction operation. So if anyone's actually going to pull this off on you, you uh, kind of, you've got some pretty powerful enemies. <laughs> I like the idea of liquid nitrogen more. I like the idea of possibly having having to have six people carry this drum of liquid with you and uh, having to do it on the sly in the middle of the night. <laughs> if it's food grade liquid nitrogen. Uh, yeah. Okay, but that, uh, you still have to admit that's a lot of trouble to go through. I mean, if you're doing it, then you don't really care. I mean, if you're, if you're doing it, you've either been paid very well to do it or you're a government agency, but I'm saying that most rogue sysadmins in your organization is, are, are probably not going to pull off something like this. Problem. In general, in ASV, that's cheaper is actually going to uh, be more strict because they want, like a mechanic, they want to get you in on the initial price and then start dinging you on all the violations, on all the violations they find. In fact, actually, you're more likely to find a lenient ASV if you shell out more money than if you shell out a small amount of money. But the last audit I've seen was two years ago and I'm pretty sure that, and of course at this point, just about every Tom, Dick, and Harry was wanting to start their own authorized security vendor agency. I'm pretty sure that at this point Visa has cracked down and said, we have to start putting in standards. I mean, the PCI, the th main three PCI compliance, uh, com com uh, compliance setters, that is Visa, MasterCard, and Discover, put together a set of rules, but like politicians putting, putting rules together, they accidentally left it to a completely different body to interpret those rules. And basically, Visa is cracking down on that now. Visa actually, Visa has their own ASV. I mean, they're extremely expensive, but their own ASV says, says 
we only need to encrypt traffic when you're going between two completely physically uh, separate locations. Their own, I mean, the funny thing is because Visa, one of the funny things that I find about Visa is because Visa automatically puts themselves at level one, they actually have their own, they their, they, their own auditors that basically audit certain branches with, uh, some very, with some very strict guidelines. It kind of reminded me of McDonald's saying, of McDonald's introducing their own health check, which is 10 times worse, 10 times more strict than any health depart, any uh, government health department check. So. I mean, most people will actually do it th themselves because the last thing you want to do is spend the money for an outside team to come in just because uh, a PC uh, PCI authority mandated it. But um, but that's pretty that's pretty much it. Uh, 